And it says, My God, remember Tobiah and Sambal as according to their works, and the prophetess uh, Nodia and the rest of the uh, prophets who have made me, who would have made me afraid. He would have been afraid, but he was a man of prayer, and you can't shake a man or a woman of prayer. Because a vision can't be birthed without prayer. Let me say that again. A vision can't be birthed without prayer. It's only as we pray over the vision that God will breathe life on it. And until God breathes on the dry bones, they will remain dead. If we could stand for the reading of God's word. Hallelujah. Um, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1 to 3. And uh, let's read it together. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. The just shall live by faith. And um, so I just want to take up um, where I left off. Uh, the week before last, we were talking about vision. And, um, you know, Habakkuk chapter 2 tells us to write or to clarify the vision, um, uh, to make it clear so that others can understand it and run with it. And so I'm hoping, therefore, today uh, uh, to share uh, a little bit more on vision this week and next week, um, and hopefully make, uh, you know, the vision of this church a little bit clearer. Um, because the last week I spoke, I, I shared our story um, in an effort to help you to understand, uh, uh, you know, what drives us, where we've come from, uh, what we've uh, been through, what we've, you know, experienced along the way, and what God has, has done along the way to bring us to this point. Amen. So in essence, I shared the why of our vision, and hopefully uh, this week and next week, I'll, I'll share on, on the how. Um, uh, because too many times, you know, we deal with the how without ever uh, addressing the why. And, um, or else we, we deal with the, uh, the, the why, but we don't follow on with the how. Because the, the how, uh, you know, addresses, I guess, practical steps that we can take to see this vision come to pass. Because while it's one thing to see it, it's another to be it. It's one thing to see a vision, it's another to step into a vision, amen? And so certainly to some degree for me to be standing here today in the National Boxing Stadium speaking to all of you, we've stepped into our vision to a degree, but I believe there's so much more that God wants to do in this city in Jesus' name, amen? And so that's why I'd like you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. Because uh, Nehemiah is, is, is such an inspiring book. Nehemiah is a man that God gave a, a vision. And, um, and, and you know, that's wonderful. But the fact that Nehemiah had a vision wasn't unusual. Uh, the fact is the graveyards are full of people who had a vision that wasn't realized, even partially. But, you know, what was, uh, like I said, uh, special about Nehemiah wasn't that he had a vision, but rather that he saw that vision actually come to pass. Psalm 27 and verse 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I just read during the offering in, 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 in Corinthians chapter 9 about, uh, you know, earthly blessings. You know, there's things that God wants to do for you in this life. And it's so important you don't allow, you know, religious people to talk you out of the blessings that God has for you in Jesus' name. Amen. This isn't about greed. This is about faith. 
and recognizing that faith will impact every aspect of your being. Not just eternity, but more, you know, this life, amen? Not just the next, but in this life. And so, anyway, uh, how many of you want to see revival in the land of the living? Amen? <laughs> revival, glory to God, revival in your time, in, in your generation, in your nation, Amen. This is uh, not just somewhere else or in a previous uh, generation, but, but here and now in Jesus' name. Right, right here in Dublin, Ireland. Glory to God. And so that's what I'm believing for. So vision is a key part to seeing that fulfilled, to seeing that coming to pass. You know, Nehemiah had a vision for Jerusalem and uh, in particular for the walls of Jerusalem. And, um, you know, that's a wonderful thing. He had, he had a vision, but contrary to all odds, he saw that vision come to pass. And, and that's a, a, a very powerful thing because he is forever immortalized as the man that God used to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. I mean, multitudes of people saw the problem, but he was the man that God used to do something about it in Jesus' name. And so I believe that Nehemiah discovered some keys um, uh, that we can apply in our lives and in this church too. And so regarding practical steps that we can take regarding the realization of this vision, the first one is pray. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 11. Thank you, Jesus. Nehemiah verse 1, and uh, it says... The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of the brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open so that we may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and we have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. What is the one word that is repeated over and over and over again in chapter 1? Pray, pray, pray. Pray, pray. He heard the, 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 the testimony of what, what had, had gone on in Jerusalem. And, you know, God gave him a burden. I believe Nehemiah had a genuine burden for Jerusalem and for his people. And, uh, and because it was a, a burden from God, it led him to prayer. Some of you think you have a burden and it leads you to worry. And it leads you to sleeplessness. And it leads you to anxiety. That's not a burden from God. And you're not dealing with it in the right way. Roll your burdens on the Lord and he will sustain you. And this is why so many people burn out. This is why so many people end up on all kinds of tablets and all kinds of medication. Because they're not learning to give that burden to the Lord in prayer. What's that old song? Take it to the Lord in prayer. It doesn't say go call a friend. It doesn't say stay up at night wondering and worrying and anxious and, uh, and, and all wound up. That's not how God wants us to be. Him will you keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on? Is your mind on Him? Is 
Is your mind on the Lord or is it on your problems? And so this is what Nehemiah did. He was burdened, but he brought it to God in prayer. I believe we will see revival in this city, but it's going to start when we step into a a deeper realm of prayer than what we... I'm not talking about just praying about, oh God, please bless Jimmy, Michael, and my mom, and my dad, and uh, thank you for meeting my needs. Amen. No, we got to move beyond that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God knows what you need. He knows what your problems are. He knows what your situation is, but too many times, believers never get their eyes off themselves... That's why they never see the breakthrough. I'll share, I'll share a key to breakthrough. Take your eyes off yourself and put it on the Lord and be about your father's business. And I assure you, you're going to start seeing breakthroughs coming in your life. <laughs> Hallelujah. So anyway, Nehemiah had a burden and he prayed and he didn't set himself up as some kind of self-righteous individual that was looking down. and every, He said, Lord, m- me and my family and our people, we have sinned. And, and they saw the fulfillment of God's warning that said, if you, if you fall away, I'll scatter you among the nations. And that's what happened. The, the, the Jewish people, they were scattered throughout the nations. But you know what? Uh, God is a God of mercy. And he also promised that if you return, um, uh, then I will, I will gather you again. And, and this is what we saw uh, two times. Miraculously, God scattered a people who were scattered throughout the nations. Never before in history has it ever been seen that a people whose nation was conquered and the peoples were scattered to the nations of the world, never were those people regathered again. And yet God did it twice with the Jewish people. And today the nation of Israel stands. And is an everlasting testimony to God's miracle working power in, in uh, can a nation be born in a day, as it says in the book of Isaiah. Yet, amazingly, this is what happened May, May 14, 1948. God is a miracle working God. He can, he can make the dry bones live. He can raise up an army from, from dead bones. He can raise up a nation just like that. And so this is what, what uh, Nehemiah prayed. He brought it to God in prayer. And, um, and so this is the first key, I believe, to revival. Nehemiah had a burden for a city which he committed to prayer. Charles G. Finney. Unless I had the spirit of prayer, I could do nothing. I love Charles G. Finney. He was, he was a tremendous revivalist. God used him to, to, to I believe, as, as a, a key person in the second great awakening in, in America. And, um, and, and, you know, America, in, in, in many ways, has lived on the fumes of, of, of those past revivals. But I, I, I really feel it's come to the end of that, and we need to see a new awakening. That's why it's encouraging to see what's happening in, in Auburn uh, uh, University. But we can't live on yesterday's experience. We have to have fresh bread from heaven. We have to have fresh oil. You, you've anointed my head with fresh oil, it says in Psalm 92. We need fresh oil. You can't live on yesterday's spiritual experiences. Amen? And so Charles G. Finney said, I can do nothing unless I have the spirit of prayer. And for those of you who are unaware of his ministry, and um, he was a lawyer. He got converted, and God used him tremendously. And um, and, and incidentally, some of his sermons were, you know, up to two hours long. But but he saw tremendous conviction. Uh, he worked with a brother called Brother Nash, and this man would go into a town, and he would just start interceding and praying, and 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 he would lock himself in the room. Uh, there's a story one time where the the, the woman who owned the house was was really really. St- Troubled because she said, I went into him and he was lying prostrate on the floor and he was just groaning. He, she didn't understand, you know, the intercession, but this man did. And because he would intercede and pray, suddenly people would just start falling under conviction in the middle of the street. And, and you know, this tremendous revival would come. And, you know, Charles G. Finney used to preach what he would call searching sermons. And, um, and, and I think that's, that's very much uh, something we need to be mindful of. Um, uh, it's wonderful to see what's happening, uh, you know, in, in that university. But, 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 you know, let me say this. I believe the end times revival is not just going to be an end times revival of singing or worship or even prayer. It's going to be a, a revival of the proclamation of God's word. You see, th- there's something about, and I'm not just talking about the reading of God's word. I'm talking about the proclamation of the word of God. There is power when the word of God is proclaimed and when it is applied. 
You know, Jesus went into the temple and all the religious devils were quite happy when he was reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But when he applied it and said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, suddenly all hell breaks loose because all of these demons are agitated. And so, again, I believe this end times revival will not just be about singing or about worship or about prayer. It's going to be about the Word of God proclaimed without apology, without reserve, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. I'm probably getting a little bit ahead of myself with the message, but um, I think this is important. So you have to ask yourself, are you ready for revival? You have to ask yourself, am I ready for revival? Because the word of God is going to come in a power that's not been seen before. And if you can be triggered, if you can be offended, you will be. But there will be power and there will be demonstration of that word going forth in these days to come, I believe. Because, uh, again, it's clear, you know, the enemy is, is not playing games and, and neither should we be. And so, again, let me read that quote by Charles G. Finney. Unless I had the spirit of prayer, I could do nothing. What might God do among us if only we would humble ourselves and pray and seek the face of God? Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Prayer is absolutely key to revival. You see, our nation needs healing, there's no doubt. And the secret, well, the Bible here reveals the answer is simple, prayer. But it's not just prayer. It's prayer with repentance. Turn from their wicked ways. And this is the problem. This is the problem. There's been a, a preaching over the last number of years where, where pastors are kind of picking and choosing and step, b b stepping over that and, and avoiding this and, and don't mention that. That is not preaching. That's a TED talk. But I believe in Jesus' name, this is the day where God's going to raise up preachers who are full of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Men and women who have, who have fire in their bones and can't keep it in. Glory to Jesus. Just like the disciples, you know, uh, judge for yourselves whether it's, it's right for us to obey God, obey man rather than God. As for us, we can't help but speak of the things we have seen and we have heard. And you see, it's in prayer that you will see and hear things. It's in prayer that you will touch things by faith. It's in prayer that we will see things birthed. If my people... It doesn't say about the world. If my people will humble themselves and what? Pray. Just say it. Pray. Thank you, Jesus. It's not prayer if it doesn't include repentance. We need to, re to repent of being too busy to pray or too distracted to pray or too arrogant to pray. When we're surprised at, at failure in our lives, our struggle in our lives, and yet we've been prayerless, that's an indication that we are arrogant because arrogant people don't pray. Job 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can, that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is the one who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I've heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent. In dust and ashes. I've heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. I believe there's a greater realm that God wants us to step into. Where it goes beyond being in our head and it goes down into our heart. Where it's not just about theory, it's about experience. Because the Bible I read says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you tasted of his goodness? Have you tasted of his mercy? Do you walk in his presence or like so many others? Are you just another zombie walking around with your dumb phone? I've decided to rechristen it. Dumb phones. They don't make you smart. They're dumb. They make you dumb. It might be smart, but you're not because it'll turn you into a vegetable. 
how about we do something radical and get back to just using them for calling people? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Sorry. Some of you sit and say, Pastor John, you really hate phones. Um, <laughs> the time has come. Our hearts, our homes, and our nations need healing. We can't act like bystanders while, while, while a whole generation is, is deceived by the devil and is swept away by the lies of Satan. You know, by deception, by witchcraft, by immorality and perversion. No, we need to stand in the gap for our generation. God is looking for a man or a woman who will pray, who will stand in the gap. You know, the blatant perversion and wickedness and witchcraft, uh, you know, that we're seeing displayed. I mean, I don't know if anybody saw the, 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 the Grammy Awards or the, the Super Bowl. We need to be praying for America. Jesus. I absolutely believe that current administration is sold out to Satan and is looking to give that nation over to Satan. But they're not going to prevail in Jesus' name. They're not going to prevail in Jesus' name. So many God-fearing men and women in that nation. We declare the purpose of God for America shall prevail. Praise Jesus. You know, uh, what's your man from Klaus Schwab from the WEF talks about a, a, a fourth industrial revolution. I think it's, it's, it's a euphemism for a fourth Reich. But uh, you know what? There's not going to be a fourth uh, revolution. We believe there's going to be a, a great awakening in Jesus' name. A great awakening in our nations. A third great awakening in the U.S. and an awakening through the nations, in Jesus' name, to the purposes of God. But you know what? When we see these things, this, this, this open, blatant parading of, of, of witchcraft, of, of, of just demon worship. I mean, if you saw the, the, the uh, I think it was the, the Grammys, they had like a, a man dressed as a woman inside a cage with, with people with pitchforks and flames and, 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 uh, and just all of this demonic imagery. Uh, you know, it's an indication of how lost our generation is. We need to pray. We need to pray for them. You know, Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, uh, I believe, addresses the spirit of the times. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Absolutely, there's a time to talk about the love of God, the mercy of God. But don't neglect to mention the wrath of God. And the Bible says that in the end days that the wrath of God is going to be revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men um, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I mean, this is exactly what big tech has been doing for quite a number of years in curating the message that goes out there because they want to brainwash a generation to buy into the narrative that's being pushed, which ultimately, I believe, is about creating, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a one world government and, and, and facilitating uh, the furtherance of an antichrist agenda. Men who suppress the truth. We, we saw it there just in the last week or two where, you know, doctors from Stanford and, and, and uh, uh, you know, many renowned and eminent doctors were, were thrown off Twitter simply because they were giving what they saw as, as clear medical evidence with regards to issues they saw with the vaccine. And I know, don't mention the V word, but, uh, you know, you have this, this, this curating of information that big tech has been doing uh, and, and you know, essentially uh, silencing voices that they don't like or agree with. And that's not democracy. I'm sorry that the, the parallels between what's happening, um, you know, over the last number of years throughout the Western world is not too unlike a modern version of the, the reality that people lived, with, lived under during the Soviet, um, the Soviet Union. Where, you know, if you didn't play the ball, if you didn't play the game, and if you didn't cooperate, um, uh, you weren't allowed to, to, to progress. And, um, and so anyway, this is the spirit of the age, but I believe when we pray. And so there are men who are suppressing the truth. That's why they wanted churches closed. They don't want truth being proclaimed. And it says, uh, because that which may be known of God is manifest to them, but God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. And this is why I think we could all do with spending less time in this and more time in this. Amen? Because 
I honestly believe whether it's TV or phones or all of this media is giving us a very flawed perspective of the world. And there's so many believers right now who are anxious, they're fearful, they're worried. Some of them can't even sleep at night by the things they're seeing happening around them. But I think it's important for us to remember that God sits on the throne. He is in control. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. And whether you're talking about the Antichrist or Satan or anybody else, they are not in control. God is. God is in control. And I don't know about you, I've read this book to the end and I see that truth prevails in the end. That's why Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. Sometimes you just have to fight through some things. Glory to God. But we have the victory in Jesus' name. And it says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. What was the issue with the early church? They were presented with the, with the, the, the question, uh, government or God, Caesar or God. And, and what are we being faced with with all of this, the, you know, climate change religion, the LGBT were being rammed down people's throats with, uh, you know, even schools seeking to subvert the right of parents by feeling they have a right to somehow tell your, your boy they could be a girl or a girl they could be a boy. This is about the very same question as Christians. Do we acknowledge God as the ultimate arbiter of truth or do we accept government and celebrities and media as the ones who define what's right? or wrong. You've got to make that decision very quickly about who you're going to serve and what you believe because you're going to be confronted with that more and more in the days that we are in. I don't know about you. I've made a decision. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen? How many of you are going to do the same? Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever." Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. Likewise, even the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful. That's what the Bible says. That this activity is shameful. You can parade it all you want. You can call it pride. But you're taking pride in what is shameful. And receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things that are not fitting. And that's what we're seeing in this generation. A generation that has a debased mind, who calls good evil, and who call evil good. And I made a decision, I'm not going to apologize for what the word of God says. I'm going to walk in the light. I'm not going to walk in the darkness, and I'm not going to pretend that a lie is the truth. And I'm not going to apologize for what the Word of God says. And so this is why, again, we must understand that the Word of God is very clear about some things. And it is in prayer that we change things. It's in prayer. People are not our enemy. Understand this. I address some things in a, in a, in a frank way, and I think I'm getting more frank the older I'm becoming. I think that's, that's one of the benefits of getting older, um, is you don't care so much about what people think. Um, but, but, but you know what? Uh, people are not our enemy. It's the devils that are working through people, and through institutions, and through governments, and through organizations. They are our enemy. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but we are in a battle nonetheless. Do not be under any illusion about that. You are in a battle. If you choose to try to be neutral, that's your choice. The enemy is still going to walk all over you. That's why the only way out of this is to fight. Because the church is not going out with a whimper. We're going out with a shout in Jesus' name. The Bible says there is a shout of a king among them. Come on, give a shout of praise to the Lord right now in Jesus' name. God has only one thing for you. I don't know what your problem is. God has only one thing for you, and that is victory in Jesus' name. Victory, victory in Jesus' name. 
We are victorious people, and it's in prayer we win the victory. That's why we need to pray. Don't just watch or complain at the craziness. Pray. The book of Nehemiah is filled with prayer. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, and it says, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Verse 5, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven. Nehemiah prayed, Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 4. And so I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them night and day. Nehemiah 5 and verse 19. Remember me, O God, for good, according to all that I've done for this people. He's praying, he's praying, he's praying the whole time. Uh, Verse uh, 14, and it says, My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalas according to their works, and the prophetess uh, Nodia, and the rest of the uh, prophets who have made me who would have made me afraid. He would have been afraid, but he was a man of prayer. And you can't shake a man or a woman of prayer. Because a vision can't be birthed without prayer. Let me say that again. A vision can't be birthed without prayer. It's only as we pray over the vision that God will breathe life on it. And until God breathes on the dry bones, they will remain dead. John 15 and verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do? Without me you can do? Remember that. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. And this is why more than anything else, Pastor John and myself, we would ask you to pray for us. Because we know that we can do nothing without God. And you see, we recognize this is a spiritual battle. And Satan is not playing games even if much of the church is. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 12. I'm going to read from verse 10. When Sanballat the the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Satan is deeply disturbed when you begin to get a burden for your generation. When you begin to care about somebody other than just yourself. When you begin to pray and believe for, for, your, for your nation, for your people, for your generation to come to Christ, suddenly all of hell takes notice of that believer because suddenly they're a threat. Okay? And so in verse 13, I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates were burned with fire. But verse 12 says, I rose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do to Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one in which I rode. And so Nehemiah goes out by night um, to, to look over the land. And, you know, like Nehemiah, some of these things I've kept in my heart for, for many years, but there's a divine timing to some things. Galatians 4 and verse 14. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The NIV. But when the set time had fully come, the new living. But when the right time came, God sent his son. Because when you do the right thing, at the right time, you become an unstoppable force. Amen? Amen? But, but pastor, these are, these are dark times. And, and, you, and you're talking all about vision. Well, you know what? Light shines best in dark times and tough places. Amen? And and nothing, and I I, I will say this. I I acknowledge, I appreciate that many people are hurting right now. People are struggling to put food on the table, you know, heat their homes. People are even losing jobs right now. But let me say this. Hurting people need hope and they need help. And this is why we have to have vision. We can't afford to play it safe. We have to have vision. You know, yesterday I was driving around the city looking at a, a, a number of buildings. And I was looking at one building and it was just, it was huge. But I could just see so many things that we could do. Particularly in regards to, you know, even having an, a, a dorm for, for people you bring from the street. And, you know, having a, a big area for the children and for the, the youth and the young adults and you know, so many things you can do if you have the space, but it takes, it takes vision to believe, and it takes faith to believe for these things. Um, and, and this is why I think it's under, uh, important to understand we have to have vision. 
You know, pick literally any area of this city or any other city around the world, and you will find that the biggest buildings were built by people with vision. People who had vision for shoppers, uh, vision for homeowners, vision for renters, um, vision for athletes, for for car buyers, uh, even people who had vision for prisoners. Think about the people that built these huge prisons in various countries. That was somebody who said they had a vision for prisoners. You know, and this is why, again, you look in the world and you see uh, so much uh, vision. I mean, we're in a, a stadium that was built by people who had a vision for boxers. Why, why then is vision so lacking at times in the church? Nothing threatens the devil more than vision that is covered by and coupled with believing prayer. You see, vision on its own is, is like I said the first week, it's, it's, you know, it's like seeds without soil or water or sunshine. But when you couple vision with believing prayer, that's when you start to see things coming to pass in Jesus' name. Nothing threatens the devil more than vision that is covered by and coupled with believing prayer. That's why he fights both. He will try and distract you when you pray. Uh, how many of you know if you sit down in front of the TV, you don't start thinking of all the things you need to do? Or when you're scrolling on your phone, you're distracted. But you know what? Sit down with your Bible. Or get in your knees and start to pray. And suddenly you start thinking, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do the other. You know what? It's the devil. He wants to distract you. He doesn't want you to pray. So he fights both. And that's why, let me say this. He wants us to think small. If we even think at all. Too distracted by social media to pray. Too divided by ego to work together. Too proud to get behind a vision. Too offended to stay in a church long enough to make a difference. Too lazy to wait on God and hear from Him. But those who do God's work in God's way for God's glory will see God's power demonstrated. You see, Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported to them all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. It doesn't say they went and they demonstrated or they went and they got people to try and get together and and try and build an army or do something crazy. No, it says they lifted their voices to God in one accord. They prayed. They prayed, and because they prayed, they saw the power of God demonstrated. Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, we see the disciples were thrown into jail. Um, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all at one accord in Solomon's temple porch. Yet none of the rest there joined them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of men, both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Prayer. If we will pray, God will fill this building before we leave it. I believe that. We need to be praying. Are you praying for your friends, for your family, for your neighbors? Are you inviting them to church? Number one reason why people come to church is because somebody else invites them. We were on the street yesterday. I was so blessed to see so many people on the street. We had one, one little girl, 10 years of age, another girl, 12 years of age, out there giving tracts and trying to win people to Jesus Christ. I was just, thank you, Jesus. Come on. You see, prayer is key to power. Our powerlessness is evidence of our prayerlessness. Prayer is key to power. If we want to have power, we have to pray. Psalm 105, 19. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. You see, it's prayer that makes us sensitive to the timings of God and the leading of his spirit. You know, harvest is entirely dependent upon us going in God's timing, led by His Spirit. Going in God's timing, not in ours. I mean, you can take a combine harvester to the fields in December, and you're going to come back empty. But you take that same harvester to the fields in June, July, or August, and you get a bumper harvest. What makes the difference? Timing. 
Amen? Because, and let me say this, I believe it's time. I believe it's time for Dublin. I believe it's time for Ireland. We need to open our eyes and realize the harvest is great in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And so Jesus said this in John 4, 35. Do you not have a saying it's still four months and until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. And I pray that God will give us that ability to look at the fields and see that it's time for harvest in Jesus' name. It's time for our generation to come to Christ. The New Living says this. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Wake up and look around. People have tried all sorts of ideologies and philosophies and religions and lifestyles. And invariably, it has left them empty and disillusioned. But we have the answer. Jesus is the answer for our generation. So let's, let's rise up and take this message to the world. That's what I love in, in, in Acts chapter 5. You know, the disciples were locked up and um, the, the Pharisees had locked them up. God sends an angel. Um, an angel Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Acts 5 and verse 19 and 20. The... Um, there's another verse that says, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. That's the NIV. Go tell the people all about this new life. That's what we're called to do. We're called to tell people about this new life that they can find in Jesus Christ. Daniel 2 and 21. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. You know, there was things I've kept in my heart till I knew the time was right, but I believe the time is now. And so we're sharing vision so that you can understand, like I said, where we came from, what God has done in bringing us to this place. And truly, God has done great things in bringing us this far. But let me say this, this isn't the end of the journey. I believe it's just the beginning. You know, the book of Joshua, chapter 3, God speaks to Joshua and he said, and... Um, do not come near the ark, that you may know the way by which you may go. For you have not passed this way before. God says this to Joshua. They're just on the edge of the promised land. And God says, you haven't been this way before. Amen. And so, um, and Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. And so I believe we need to expect great things from the Lord. Because there is no blueprint or map for revival. You have not been this way before. There's no blueprint, like I said, for, for revival. You have to pray and seek the Lord and, 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 and believe. And, and let me say this. This is a pioneering work. By faith, we are breaking new ground for the kingdom. And it's only as we pray that God will make a way. Isaiah 43 and 19. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The new living. For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I'll make a pathway through the wilderness. I'll create rivers in the dry wasteland. Let me read a number of quotes here from Charles G. Finney. A revival may be expected when Christians have a spirit of prayer for a revival. That is, when they pray as if their hearts are set upon it. When Christians have the spirit of prayer for revival, when they go about groaning in their heart, uh, groaning out their heart's desire, when they have real travail of soul. Prevailing prayer is that which secures an answer. Saying prayers is not offering prevailing prayers. That's the problem. Most of us just say prayers. He said, Saying prayers is not prevailing prayer. The prevalence of prayer does not depend so much on the quantity as the quality. What, what is the quality of your prayers? Nehemiah 2 and 1. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, the 20th uh, year of King Exartes, when the wine was performed, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Chapter 1 is about prayer. Chapter 2 is about the birthing of that vision. 
Now, I'd never been sad in his presence uh, before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Why? The king could just click his fingers and have you killed. And I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should not my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? And the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Have you ever prayed like that? that those silent prayers you pray when you're in an interview? Or those silent prayers you pray when you're with your boss? Are those silent prayers you prayed as a little kid when your mom was, was asking you about something and about to dish out some retribution? <laughs> okay, maybe you didn't have the youth I did. <laughs> My mom was good for two laps of the house. We used to just take off running. She'd grab a wooden spoon or break a branch off a tree. She would come after you, man. <laughs> oh, shaka kaka. <laughs> I've sensed something of the wrath of God. She, she could run. Man, she was on fire. <laughs> but this is the beautiful thing. I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found sight, favor in your sight, I ask that you may send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Nehemiah expresses the vision in such a concise, succinct manner. Just one sentence, he is able to do that. But there's a reason why. He is able to express the vision in just one sentence because his vision has been distilled to the point that he can state it simply and plainly. And this is why Habakkuk 2, where I read at the beginning, gives us the principle, the simple formula, receive, write, and run. I will stand on my watch and pray and wait on the Lord to see what he says to me. That's prayer, prayer, prayer. And it's in prayer you receive it. But then he says, write it that people may run with it. And that's what I'm doing over these weeks. I'm just doing my best to, to try and share with you the, the vision in our heart of where we want to go and what we want to see come to pass. You see, we receive the vision as we seek God in prayer. And this is what God does in our hearts as we pray. He sifts and he searches us. And he purifies the vision, making it clear. Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Just give me five minutes and I'm finished. Maybe the reason why we can't make it to, uh, clear to others is that it's not clear to us ourselves because we haven't spent enough time in prayer. You know, Psalm 73 is such a beautiful psalm. The psalmist is, is so frustrated, um, you know, by what is happening. It's a psalm of Asaph, and he's going on about the wicked. Why are the wicked not judged? And sometimes we can look at some of the, you know, agendas at play in the world and say, Lord, why are these evil people here looking to indoctrinate children, looking to, you know... Push forward these agendas, these, these people who are convinced the world is overpopulated and are looking to, I believe, depopulate it. I mean, uh, I, I can't remember, was it in, uh, I think it was in Australia, um, uh, you know, there was a woman, uh, because she wasn't vaccinated, they decided they wouldn't give her a heart transplant, a mother of children. And it's this, this kind of, uh, you know, Nazi ideology that decides who lives and dies. It's not Christian. Irrespective of what your opinion is about vaccines or anything else. You know, when people set themselves up as God and are deciding on who lives and who dies, that is demonic. That's demonic. And we need to pray that God's going to raise up God-fearing leaders who are going to administrate on behalf of the people they're meant to be ruling. Amen. Are meant to be uh, governing, uh, are helping, are uh, providing for. But anyway, here he's frustrated. He said, God, why, why is all these things happening? Verse 16, when I taught how to understand it, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. See, there's some things that will not make sense to you until you bring it before the Lord in prayer. Until you come into his presence, 
there's some things in your life you are not going to work it out by staying awake at night, lying in your bed, trying to work out the problems of the world, trying to work out your own problems. There are some things that will only become clear when you enter into that secret place. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah. He has the answers to your questions. He has the provisions for your need. Whatever they may be, it's in his presence. Pray. Turn to your neighbor and say pray. pray. Isaiah 14, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, the temptation at times is to run ahead and try and make things happen in the flesh. And we, we see what happened to Abraham when that happened. But you know what? It's as we pray and as we wait on God that he changes our hearts and prepares us for our destiny. It's as we pray that our dreams will be birthed and our vision will come forth. It's as we pray that the manifestation will come. You know, Luke chapter 18 is recorded, I believe, um, uh, to encourage us but also to warn us. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. That men ought always to what? Pray. Come on. That men ought always what? What are you going to do when you walk out here today? Pray. What are you going to do tomorrow? Pray. What are you going to do next week? Pray. What are you going to do? Pray. Yeah, beautiful. Some of you sitting there saying, I'll say whatever you want. Just, just please, <laughs> just, just finish it up. I've had enough. I've had all week to wait to talk to you, so I'm just glad to be back. <laughs> There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me for my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. How many of you know our God is a judge, but he's not an unjust one. Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? What God is looking for? Faith. He's looking for you to believe. So it's not just about praying, going through the motions. It's praying in faith. Luke 19, 44 you did not know the time of your visitation. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? You see, Jesus Christ is coming, but he wants us to believe. And this parable is there, I believe, recorded as uh, to encourage us and to warn us that we have a part to play. We must persist and prevail in prayer. We must persist and prevail in prayer. Vision will remain unborn or at least only partially realized if we do not cover it and bathe it in believing, fervent prayer. James 5 and verse 16, as the worship group come forward, it says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What is a fervent prayer? When you're praying spirit, soul, and body. When you're focused on that prayer. When you're focused on what you're saying. When you're actually believing that that prayer will come to pass. Not like the, the disciples who were praying that Peter would be released. They were having a prayer meeting for Peter to be released. Peter knocks on the door and they don't believe he's there. How many times are we just like that? We're praying for something and then we're talking ourselves out of what we have prayed for. You've prayed for healing. Oh Lord. I, 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 no. You're talking yourself out of what you're praying for. Oh, Lord, nothing has changed. Who says? Do you have more faith in what you can feel or what you can see than what God has promised in his word? Pray. Sow to yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground because it is time to seek 
the Lord. That was a favorite scripture of Charles G. Finney. God, you know, God used them to bring revival all through the United States. Sow to yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. What, what, what is fallow ground? It's a field that's been left untilled for years, and the ground goes as hard as concrete, and you have to break it up. Well, you know what? We all have areas like that in our heart, in our lives, areas of hardness, areas of rebellion, areas of laziness. Areas of apathy, areas where we've permitted unforgiveness or bitterness or, 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 or complacency. And God wants to drive the plow of his word through your heart. That's what's happening here every week. That's how I would encourage you. Get in here every week and, and come ready to hear in Jesus' name. And even better, come early and sit in the seat and pray. Amen. It's time to seek the Lord. I believe it's time for revival in Jesus' name. It's time for awakening. Glory to God. If you could stand to your feet today. You know the Lord loves you. And I believe he wants to do miracles. And I believe he's going to confirm his word today. And maybe there's people who are watching and you're sick in your body. Or maybe you've got some situation going on. You know, we love you and we're going to agree with you and believe for God's healing power to touch you. Whether you're watching on a TV or whether you're right here with us today. The Lord is here in this place. But the first thing I want to do is address those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it was so beautiful yesterday to talk to people on the street and to, to minister to them and to see so many people who were there. Just to minister the love and grace of God to people. But you know what? None of us are here forever. We all have a set number of years and months and days and hours and minutes and seconds before we leave this planet and we step into eternity. And what I want to ask you today, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Do you have peace with God? I'm not asking, are you a good person? The Bible says none of us are good. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. But what I want to ask you today is, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Have you encountered His love, His mercy? Have you been born again? Do you have the assurance that if this was your last day on planet Earth, that you would go to be with God in heaven? Man goes to his eternal home, but the mourners go through the streets. Hopefully everybody here today has a home. When the service is finished and you've gone for a coffee or gone for something to eat or been with your friends, you're going to eventually go home. The time is going to come when we leave this earth and we will go to our home. And the Bible is very clear that there is only two eternal homes. You will go to, to your home in heaven or you will go to your home in hell. And that is, that is a question at times that just grips me and disturbs me to think that there are, you know, nice people who, who you know, have, have families and, and pay their taxes and, and are kind to people and live their lives and yet they die and they go to a Christless eternity. Because being a good person will not get you to heaven. And let me say this. Eternity is too long. And life is too short. To play games with your eternal soul. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? You could own everything. And yet lose your soul.